one of the big stories uh, this week is the ANC NEC Lekhotla and uh, what it came out with with regards to race relations. There is uh, the DA also weighing in and uh, of course uh, Malema also making his self felt. Uh, and to help us to walk through uh, all of these issues is political analyst Ralph Mateja. Ralph, should Musi Maimani have been taking leadership lessons for, from De Klerk or not? Well, you but know, if he was, you know, yeah. I think that uh, let's 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 stick to the facts here. Ditlarg is one of the people who played a role towards the end of apartheid. He did play a role towards that in the negotiation towards the end of apartheid. That's a fact. You cannot take that away. And I think that for that reason, he's still considered one of the eminent elders in South Africa. So I think it is up to Mr. Maimani to decide whether or not to take a, a leadership lesson from then. And I think he might have found it fitting to do so. And I don't think he should be ostracized for doing that. that but he denies it flat out. He says, I have only met the man once in my life. I've never taken leadership lessons yes. to him. And in fact, he goes on to say, what is there to learn from De Klerk? I think that uh, he ignores the historical fact. And I also think that uh, he's yielding to the public pressure out of this. You know, the thing with <laughs> politicians is that uh, sometimes you need to take a position. Uh, and flip-flopping has become one of the characters within the, the mm. DA. You have seen their mayor for Johannesburg going against affirmative action, public <laughs> pressure mounting, <laughs> or no, I, you know, I'm willing to consider that. They flip-flop. Why can't they yeah. take a position? I, I think it's better to have someone who takes a principled position and sustain it. And Mr. Maimani seems to be flip-flopping. It looks like he gets up in the morning, looks at the political wind where it's going, mm. and take a position from <laughs> that. That, for me, is not a sign of yeah. a strong leadership. And Herman Mashaba the same as you said we had Herman on the show yes. here and we thought at the time although we never quite got him to talk about it that his stated opposition to BEE or most aspects of exactly. BEE this is going to come back to haunt him he's not going to get the votes of Soweto uh, or the black intelligentsia for that matter if he's against all affirmative action and empowerment which is sitting right 300 years of discrimination when I firstly heard about his position on that I said that bold man, let's hear his justification. I mean, you read through the literature, there are people who are against affirmative action, mm. vast literature in the US. Even here, there are some of the judges who are in South Africa's constitutional court who want stringent assessment of affirmative action. I was waiting to hear an intelligible defense mm. on Mr. Mashaba's position, mm. but I was disappointed and when he backtracked on that. Not because I agree with his position, but yeah. I wanted him to sustain. To stick to it. Mm. And what Muzi Mayamani could have said, uh, well, I haven't taken lessons from de Klerk because he has denied it. Mm. But if I did, so what? Exactly. You should and have said that is my right And put the initiative so. back to the people accusing. But say, well, what's but actually wrong with it? But that would have been it? a dangerous narrative, no? Because we, we've seen the DA trying to come out and being very anti-racist within the DA. Because this has been their new line to say, mm -hmm. um, there's, this, uh, there's a growing narrative that the DA is the home of uh, racists in South Africa. And they're saying, no, this is not true. So how does my money begin to walk this tightrope where mm. there has to be such a clear separation from racists and racism, whilst at the same time saying, well, yeah, maybe I did take a lesson or two. I think the problem here is that uh, the DA does not have a narrative of its own. Mm. If you don't have your own narrative yeah. on the question of race, mm. and if you are responding to the narrative that is being set out there, the narrative set by the ANC, by EFF, we are bound to be inconsistent and flip-flop. Mm. But if you have your own narrative, which you thought through, and you have constructed it very well, you actually are in a better position to defend it in the public. I do not see that within the DA. They are improvising on a daily basis. What about the ANC now? Basis. NEC coming out and saying that they're going to look at institutions to make sure that it, racists are not emboldened. I don't know whether this is a very strong statement from the ANC either. Isn't it also a red herring maybe uh, to take attention mm -hmm. of other things for the election? Exactly. I mean, the, the, this whole race problem, it's, it, it came as a low-hanging fruit for the ANC. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Zuma doesn't show up. President Zuma doesn't show up in Davos. Disaster in December around uh, the Minister of Finance. Mm. And suddenly, bang, the racist issue comes. You latch on this thing for the dear life. You squeeze political capital out of that as long as you can. Have they done a good job of squeezing political capital out of it? I don't get the sense that they have. They're, they're, they're politically, they are managing the narrative because the DA cannot respond. Mm. The issue is that if the DA could respond better to this, they would be able to they could be exposed maybe. So the but DA the DA can't respond to what that you're saying having a field day. They need to be more confident and they need to be consistent and at least you know where they stand. Now interesting uh, we were saying earlier that Julius Malema you've got to give it to him. He knows where the cameras are. Exactly. He makes them point at him 
And he comes up with these slogans like a coalition of the unwilling. Perhaps Mr. Maimana, maybe on another, you know, maybe could spend more time with Julius. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> Take because he has disowned, declared on that. And you are right. Julius is the master of rhetoric. Mm. And you know one thing that he does very well. He knows he won't be implementing policy next year. Yeah. He knows he won't be held responsible to these things in a, in a short time to come. So he can go all to town with this and be as outlandish as possible. But that is his selling point. But isn't what's going to happen now? He's going to say to Maimani, come, join me in opposing the ANC. Our enemies are, we make us friends because we've got a common enemy. And I can see the DA, yeah. given what you've said now, oh gee, what should we do <laughs> and I can not imagine. make up their minds? Indeed, I mean, he called them... Uh, he, he's made a call, Julius, about the opposition getting into some form of a coalition. I mean, if I, as far as I can remember, he insults them week in, week out. Yes, mm. he does. And, but unfortunately, they have no narrative. He's in charge when it comes to public mm. discourse and very disproportionate to the amount of uh, votes they've had in the previous mm. election. Mm. So they're likely to listen, and I, I, I won't be surprised if they considered going into this coalition, it will be a disaster. There's no common ground. Uh, uh, Ralph, I, 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 must, I, I must come back to just the noise around racism that we've yeah. heard in the country. The EFF was so silent. When Penny Sparrow was breaking, there was not an EFF statement. Mm. When, uh, when Gareth Cliff, until the, rep the legal representation came in, they had no position and no view. Is silence sometimes a stronger political weapon when you are seeing the ANC and the DA scrambling to find a position and maybe the upper ground is the populace knows where we stand and therefore we will not get into the fray by issuing unnecessary statements. There was nothing. You know, it's quite a surprise because this is their area. I mean, exactly. they're the most radical party always talking about this. The only time I've had Floyd responding to questions about uh, Advocate Dalimbo for taking up the case. and. You know, that is w w only what I could hear from the EFF. But I think we also need to be cognizant of the fact that it's an election year. Yeah. Perhaps they are scared. They've never campaigned in, in, in local government election. Perhaps they are busy with what they think is their priority. Yeah. Getting ready for election. Hence, they started firing the first shot, saying that we need a coalition among the mm. opposition. I think there is an anxiety within the EFF regarding what's going to happen in this local Let's go to election. the coalition. So 2014, the EFF got 6% of the vote, and mm -hmm. then the the DA got 22, the ANC got 62. Do you, how do you see those numbers potentially moving? Well, it depends uh, on the city, doesn't it? Yes. Local election. Th there is a, a... Look, I don't think any opposition party is going to take the city of Johannesburg, the city of Tuana outright. Yeah. I think it's highly unlikely. But I think they could have uh, imposed a serious dent on the ANC's majority. The narrative here, you know. Or oh, the ANC could get less than 50. Exactly. And the opposition combined gets exactly. more than 50. Uh, exactly. That is another scenario that is possible where if, if uh, those kind of municipalities could be under the opposition, it will have to be coalition. We will talk another day about how difficult coalitions are, yeah. how unstable they are when it comes to decision making and how impossible is it to run a city here in South Africa through that. But I think that uh, if you look at the dynamics, the narrative is not that the uh, opposition is gaining, is that the ANC is losing. Mm. These are two different yeah. things. Yeah. The opposition is still quite weak and I think you have serious competition within the opposition camp. So much serious that it can actually cancel out yeah. any potential impact they could have on taking and, and the, the votes from yes. the ANC. Just a quick one before we go to break. Cecil John Rhodes, I mean, the, the Rhodes Must Fall statue has been fantastic, but money talks, as, as we know. And uh, with alumni are saying, um, no, we, if, if, the, if the statue falls, we're, p we're drawing a lot of our funding that we actually uh, channel into the university. And again, it's just come down to those who have uh, the, buying power. For the people who haven't seen it, uh, Oxford University's Oriel yeah. College, which has huge bequests from Rhodes, they're big donors. Like we're talking millions of pounds yeah. have said, if you do anything with that statue, we're taking money out. They also are upset that the college is even thinking about it. Yeah, you know, it's about the funding and it's about uh, the classics uh, uh, traditional funders of those mm. institutions. And I think one of the thing, the, the issue that is missing in this discussion, whenever you talk about roads must fall and everything, uh, we're looking at the statue and all, but people don't want to actually distance themselves from roads wealth. 
that mm. have been accumulated in the bad way, as it has been said. That is not part of the of the discussion. Maybe someone need to say that we are actually appropriating the wealth. We just want the statue to go. <laughs> but roads, yeah. uh, it's a legacy. The mining, it's, it's all that is uh, uh, rich people who actually are funding those. But we need to talk about what do we yeah. do with the wealth. What interests me is this. that the number of Rhodes scholars who are now wanting Rhodes' statue to fall. I think there's a contradiction. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's like but wait, let's, let's, let's challenge this a little bit. So let's look at our own institutions in South Africa and say the University of Stellenbosch, for example, where there has been an absolute tug of war around the, the language that mm -hmm. should be used in this institution. And I, I stand to be corrected, but I think currently it's still bilingual. So you, it's either it's still both Afrikaans and English. To what extent are universities symbols of uh, modern day oppression where they are not going to transform because those who continue to fund institutions have a very clear agenda about what they want to see in the country. You know, I've spent a lot of time at universities, both as a student and as a lecturer. The most undemocratic institutions <laughs> are actually <laughs> universities, and they teach uh, they teach democracy. And I think that is going to take a while for, for for universities to transform because people are also talking about the standards. What do you mean by transformation? Are you changing the curriculum? Yeah. What are you responding to when we are changing the curriculum? And I think that institutions, universities are actually saying, let's wait this a little bit. It's Maybe it will pass. It's more difficult to transform if your funding has been cut, which is just what's happened. Exactly. Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, but uh, Ralph, with. I want to come back to your coalition story. Um, I agree with you that it's, it, it would be almost impossible or very stupid for either party to go into a formal coalition and mm -hmm. say we're going to take on the mm -hmm. ANC. But you could have tactical cooperation at certain times. For example, mm -hmm. let's say the ANC gets f uh, a minority and the opposition parties together get 52% in Port Elizabeth or Johannesburg. When the budget comes to be passed, you could say, as a matter of principle, we're going to block the ANC's budget for the city, unless they make certain changes. In other words, not ideological, but we, we, we can block you if we want to. You need a level of maturity among the opposition parties to be able to get to that. I don't think there is that level of maturity. It ah. will take a while. We need to sustain democracy for a long time for people to move out of their partisan camps yeah. and move and, 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 and join each other on such an objective. We don't even have that. I mean, look at uh, the, the fees must fall. Look at the hashtag Zuma must fall. Diverse views among the opposition. Some saying that we are not going to be part of it. Yeah. It is racist. We are not going to help. So it shows you in South Africa that the opposition has not yet coalesced to a point where they can actually cooperate. Yeah. And what we are talking about is the post-election mm. coalition, which may be still a possibility, but the pre-election yes. one... Yeah. No, it would be mad. It would be out of. But yeah. Yeah. I, I, just, just as a final thought on this, I mean, if we look at the continuum of ideology, where the DA mm -hmm. sits and where the EFF sits, in just in terms of ideology and the underlying principles of what these parties represent, it doesn't seem feasible that there could be a coalition. I can't yeah. visualize no, my money and my lemma standing together, jointly delivering a speech to anyone no, but they who's going to take them seriously. If they get elected. And no, the before the election. No, no, and, uh, impossible. This is, this is what I'm impossible. talking about. Impossible. Actually, if you look at the ideological position, you are more likely to get a coalition between the NC and the DA than That's between it. the <laughs> DA and the EFF. Yeah. When it come, because remember, when it comes to economic policy, uh, you don't really see much difference yeah. between the NC and the DA. There is difference in terms of rhetoric, whereas the EFF actually it's on the far side. So, uh, uh, and also there is lack of respect. Uh, among the opposition parties where they actually try to upstage each other yeah. in parliament. What did so we so learn from Ahang um, and, 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 and the DA? Because it certainly, again, for me, just seems like the level of maturity that I think you yeah. refer to is just not there to, even when there are close ideological alignments, it's, it's even they're just choosing who's going to be the leader of the party, then the conversation begins to disintegrate. Even if the leadership, let's say the leadership try to get together like the Ahang, and the DA issue, the voters are too far from each other to an extent that some of the voters are actually going to abscond to say that, oh, you are now getting, the mm. leadership is getting together. They, I don't think voters will realize the strategic uh, intention right. of this kind of alliances. It will take time before we get There's to that. There's a psychological dimension as well, and that is that it was unthinkable mm -hmm. for the ANC to lose power in any of yeah. these met metropol metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. and indeed the country or a province apart from the Western Cape. If they get 52% and still in the majority, or 
then it becomes thinkable. Yeah. And I think that would be a, a big... The big takeaway I take from this conversation is, should Musi Maimane take leadership lessons from Julius Malema? And this <laughs> is what we got from Ralph Pataka. Or and, and de Klerk. And, and, oh, and de Klerk. Get, get the best from everyone. 